the iPhone 17 Pro. I'll begin this with a demonstration. This is a rod made of pure aluminum, and this is a rod made of titanium. You are quickly gonna see how much better heat travels through aluminum than it does through titanium. This is the iPhone 16 Pro. You've heard everyone say it, but I'm gonna show it to you in a really clear way. As I blow this little fiery torch onto both rods, watch how the heat moves down the length of them. The iPhone 17 Pro's body is made of aluminum all the way out to the edges and even on the new bump, where the iPhone 16 Pro, for instance, and the 17 Air have this titanium frame around the edges and then both front and back are sandwiched by glass, even on the camera bump. The insides of these phones are still aluminum, but when I put a hoodie on in the summertime, I'm gonna get hot. Titanium does a really bad job of moving heat. Look at this, I'm only blowing fire on the ends of these rods, but the aluminum rod has spread its heat all the way down the length of it, where the titanium rod is only getting hot right where the fire hits it, which means titanium works more like an insulator. The titanium one is still cold on the bottom it keeps the heat from moving. Aluminum works more like a conductor, taking the heat and moving it away from the heat source and then spreading it out into the rest of the rod and ultimately into the air around it. The bottom of this titanium rod remains cold, all the heat contained up near the fire. The fire in this case represents our CPU, the source of heat, and the aluminum rod clearly spreads that heat out like 10 times faster. Glass is really bad at conducting heat. Titanium is pretty bad at conducting heat. These titanium frames were kind of like little winter jackets for your phone. That's hyperbole. iPhone 17 Pro's aluminum body is more than 10 times better at shedding heat. And because of the heat shedding capabilities of using aluminum, plus that vapor chamber that they put in here, Apple has let this phone charge with quite a bit more power than all of the preceding iPhones to date. Quick sidebar, I see people on Reddit saying you need like a proprietary charger to get those fast speeds. And that's not true. You just can't have a dinky chintzy cord. This is an anchor battery bank, not in any way proprietary, but this battery bank has a little meter on the front of it, so it'll show you how many watts is going into the phone when it's charging. And would you look at that, 38 watts going into this phone. iPhone 16 Pro, and you can see this is low on battery, so it's still the bulk charge phase. This one will only take 20 watts. And I know the OnePlus and Geomi phones can charge at 100 watts. That's wicked fast. I'm happy with 40 watts too. Faster charging is an improvement. The table's really dirty. Where aluminum is not better, generally, is scratch and dent resistance. It's not nearly as hard as titanium, maybe more importantly, not as hard as steel. You probably don't have very many titanium surfaces in your life that are gonna scrape up against this phone. I was just talking about this in a video I made about the Apple Watch Ultra 3, but whether or not a surface will get scratched comes down to its hardness. Hardness is an actual technical term. If a harder material comes into contact with a softer material, the softer material gets scratched. A steel thing can easily scratch an aluminum thing, but an aluminum thing simply cannot scratch a steel thing. Apple did put a special anodized coating on this aluminum, kind of like a really hard skin on the not so hard metal. Unfortunately, as Jerry Rig Everything showed in his video about this phone, since they used a super sharp edge around the bump, you basically are going to knock that anodization off from that edge at some point during your iPhone 17 Pro ownership, unless you use a case. Anyone who regularly carries a pocket knife, or interestingly, an Apple card, if you have a knife in your pocket, you've got that little sharp metal clip just waiting to scrape your phone on the way in or out. And the Apple card is actually made out of titanium. So if that jumbles around in your pocket with your phone, it is gonna eventually scratch that underside. I may be unique in carrying just loose credit cards in my pocket, I don't know. I don't like a wallet. My suggestion is to switch pockets. I've been caseless now for over a year with this phone. It's just so luxurious to hold and use a bare phone as the designers intended. And I'm gonna be honest here, and this is gonna be subjective, but my personal level of satisfaction with a piece of electronics has effectively 0% relation to how pristine these sharp edges hold up over time. I just don't care if this gets dinged. If I look around at some of the most expensive things that I own, especially the things I handle a lot and really use, pro things, my cameras and lenses are all scratched up and just dinged up around the edges. My bike is all scraped up. My MacBook Pro, oh man, this was a close one. I got a couple of good gouges on the back of this big boy. Pro gear should be designed for actual use, which to me means the designer should be thinking about how to make this thing work the absolute best, not how to make it look the absolute best. Come at me, Apple Track.
I think what a lot of people who are complaining about the aluminum are missing about the iPhone 17 Pro is that it's actually, well, sort of, but finally being treated more like a pro device. If you want a super thin, elegant, beautiful sheet of glass to hold onto in your hand, and you want your phone to be more like a piece of jewelry, get the iPhone Air. I love that they make that thing for you guys now. It's got titanium, such a luxurious and exotic metal. It's got a fully glass rear, so sleek. I know this is the 16 Pro, not the Air. I don't have one. But if they're gonna sell this as a pro device, let's get my camera back out for an example. This lens and camera combo originally costs almost $5,000. The Sony A7S III. It's not beautiful. It's made out of magnesium alloy, hard plastic, and rubber. It's got exposed sharp metal edges where, yes, the anodization has rubbed off. It's got these ugly, flappy rubber cover things, but I don't care how ugly this thing is. It has generated over $100,000 for me at this point. It's gear, and this iteration of the iPhone is edging closer to gear than jewelry. Personally, if I was on the design team, I would double up this battery again and make this thing a heavy, chunky, useful pro phone. In my other life, I'm the technical director of an event production company, which means my phone generates me a lot of money as well. And boy, could I use even more battery, even though this has even more battery than before. So aluminum, yeah. Yes, it can scratch and dent easier, but it's pro level heat management functionality makes it worth it to me. The A19 Pro chip in here is very pro. The single core CPU speed in here beats the M3 laptop chips. This is an M3 Air, but it's got the M3 laptop chip in it. And the GPU scores of this thing gets just barely below the M3, like within a couple of percent. In other words, this phone is basically an M3 MacBook Air, which is also made out of aluminum. And this is gonna be a bit of a tangent, but the fact that I can't just plug this thing into my studio display using a keyboard and a mouse and have it run Mac OS is, well, it's disappointing. Of course, I understand why Apple doesn't want us to do that, but this phone and its processors could very easily handle being like daily driver desktop computer for like 90% of the office working population and that is bonkers. I'll bet this phone is fully capable of running Final Cut Pro, the full desktop version, and editing my videos at full resolution. I'll also bet that I'll never know if that's true or not. It is though. You can attach this to a studio display and it will actually work with a keyboard and mouse, but the interface is very obviously still designed for touch and a small small screen, so it's way less than ideal. So, the processor is super fast, but so what? What am I even supposed to make of this insane speed? It's not like the iPhone 16 Pro lags while doing anything. I never once in the last year found myself wishing this thing had a faster CPU. When I first got my 17 Pro, I sat here searching for ways to even show its new speed beyond just benchmarks. Because a massive CPU doesn't help you write texts or emails or go to Amazon. I think some of you are editing videos on your phone, but the programs that you can do that with are not laggy and it's never that big of a production. But it turns out, in order to keep delivering upgrades to the camera system, Apple is leaning harder and harder on just insane amounts of real-time image processing to create pictures and videos that are just impossible without lots of CPU. When you take a photo on your iPhone, your phone is immediately processing the crap out of what it's seeing. First, it never just takes one picture, even if you have live photos turned off. The phone is taking like 10 or 20 pictures super fast, and then it's digging through those to find the millisecond where your hand was the least shaky so it can pull the sharpest picture out out of the bunch. And yes, the sensor is bigger now than it was before, but it's still a puny sensor compared to a dedicated camera. Inside here, this shiny bit, the whole thing is sensor. It's like as big as the whole camera bump. Yet, this thing can produce pictures that look strikingly similar to what a big camera can. But because it has a smaller sensor, that means it's getting way less light to the sensor. So it has to do a bunch of math while combining a bunch of pictures that it's taking in an instant and then compute out what the surfaces and colors and people's faces should look like in ideal lighting conditions. And then this phone will literally stitch together different bits of all the pictures that it's taking to deliver you a better picture overall. That's the term computational photography. It's amazing and it takes a ton of processing power to do it. It also immediately post-processes these pictures after you take them, finding people and subjects and then changing the exposure to make them look correct. If you take a picture and then go and review it fast enough, sometimes you can catch the phone doing it. You'll see a person or your dog in a picture just poof into better lighting. Your phone is also shooting out LiDAR lasers out of this little black circle when it senses a person in the frame. And it's making this whole depth map of what it's looking at so that you can mess around with the focus after the fact in portrait mode. That's an app called Polycam. So right here, we're trying out the cinematic mode. Every time a new phone comes out, I like to retry this just to see if it's gotten better or not. But pretty much the iPhone is simulating 
using a big lens by making my hand out of focus in the foreground, out of focus in the background, going to be masking out my hand and pretend being out of focus. And it, I can even put my fingers in front of my face. But it's using that LiDAR to sort of make a range map so that it knows the background is way back there. Things that are back there are fuzzy, out of focus. Things that are way in front of me are fuzzy, out of focus. Even though in reality, the camera's capturing everything in focus. Let's snap to the real thing that the iPhone's capturing. You can see the background, the whole room is a mess and it's all in focus and you can see it. But if we go back to the cinematic mode, it sort of blurs out everything but me, or it's attempting to do that. But this is doing a really great job of simulating what a camera does. Because basically in real time, the phone is masking me out of this image and like and making a second layer where I'm in focus, everything else is out of focus. Around the, like the little fine parts of my hair, I think it's gonna be giving away the effect. It's hard for me to see on the monitor back there. I think this is getting good enough though that you could use this as your main shot for YouTube. The video stabilization of this phone is another computational thing that is improved forever and ever with newer, faster processors. Video just should not be as smooth as it is from a thing as small as this. I'm mounting my phone onto this very expensive camera so you can see what walking around should look like handheld from the perspective of a person's relatively shaky hands. And even this is more stable just because of the weight of these two things combined. But I've turned off stabilization on both the lens and this camera. But if I walk down the sidewalk by my house and just talk to my camera. Without stabilization, especially if you go into a light jog, your hands move around so much that it's just a dizzying mess. What the iPhone's doing is it's shooting a wider picture than you get to see, and then counteracting all of the movements that your shaky hands make by sliding around a cropped image inside that square. And you end up with this entirely gimbal-like smoothness that I know not enough people are really appreciating for what it is without having tried to get smooth shots with the camera that doesn't have stabilization on it. Last thing for the cameras, when I saw the announcement for this and I saw the wording they use, 8X optical quality zoom rather than 8X optical zoom, I knew the 8X zoom was gonna be a software trick and it is, which is totally fine, but as a photographer myself, the distinction is important. It's actually a 4X optical zoom lens, but they have doubled the density of the sensor behind the lens. So you can essentially zoom in at 200% of the 4X lens, and then that's equal to having an 8X zoom at 12 megapixels. So there's no upscaling. It is truly optical quality at 8X, but there's just a bit of wordplay because they tell you it's a 48 megapixel sensor and it is, but at 8X zoom, you're not using the whole sensor. You're getting a 12 megapixel slice of it. What you are using though, is the whole sensor to stabilize your shaky hands when zoomed in to such a distance. So this is a true 200 millimeter zoom lens. It would look a bit different if this was on the phone. And again, with my big expensive camera, without any stabilization turned on, when you're zoomed out to 200 millimeters, I'm gonna show an example on the screen here. It's pretty hard to stay really still on anything. Like the picture you see through this phone is super unrealistic, but it's real. It's just the sensors dancing around to counteract your hands movements. It's amazing. So the camera on this phone is indeed using all the new fancy CPU, GPU power. And even after you've taken your pictures, your phone is scanning away using its Apple intelligence on everything. If you didn't know this was a feature, they don't really advertise this, but I think it's kind of amazing. Go ahead and go into your iPhone's photos app, go to your albums and click on the search thing and just start typing random words. A bush, lake driveway. Who knew I've taken so many pictures of driveways? iPhone has gone through and added keywords to every photo you've ever taken. It's very handy for finding things like license plate when you're using one of those parking apps. It's another reason you shouldn't really do your benchmark testing when you first get your phone because it's gonna be going through and doing that. It's gonna be scanning all these pictures for a few hours after you first turn it on. So it's using CPU and GPU to do other stuff. You may have noticed your phone gets kind of warm the first day you own it. When searching for really intense games to show, I did land on Assassin's Creed Mirage, basically the one AAA game that I might play that's out for iOS. It works with an Xbox controller without any setup. I can even plug my phone into my studio display and then use the studio display's extra USB-C ports for the controller and a keyboard. You won't be able to see the frame rate here of the game because I'm shooting this video in 24 FPS, so that's what you're gonna see. But it's smooth, the graphics look up to date. It actually looks better than Assassin's Creed Shadows looks on the M4 MacBook Air. I was trying to find hardware comparisons online and basically landed on the numbers that say this tiny slab of aluminum and glass 
glass is the equivalent to a PlayStation 4 Pro, which on its own is pretty impressive. But then you combine that with the fact that it's doing this while using about 1 20th of the amount of electricity as a PlayStation Pro. I feel like there's a whole untapped market for older games that could be ported over to iOS. Maybe that's harder to do than I think. I don't know. The last thing I'm going to say about this faster than necessary phone computer is that Apple uses the same architecture for the A series chips as it does for the M series chips. And unless you were paying close attention during the September event, you might have missed it. But Greg Jaws Jawswiak added in a little detail about this year's GPUs. He said that the addition of these neural accelerators built into each GPU can give them a 4x advantage peak performance to the A18 Pro GPUs. Whatever those neural accelerators are, mark my words, they will make their way into the M5 chips. And I expect that to be a big part of the announcement for the M5, that its graphics performance is like way bigger jump than each generation before. The iPhone 17 Pro is more pro than the Pro phones that came before it. And I think that's a good thing. Let's let gear be gear and let this thing get dinged up. I'm here for it. If you want a beautiful shiny thing, get the iPhone Air. Goodbye. Where'd this come from?